weeks, I'd like us to bring our hearts together uh, in a word of prayer. Our God and Father, how thankful we are for the truth of our atonement, uh, that we uh, are confident people because of what you have done on our behalf, how you have made atonement in Messiah. And we get to rejoice in that and celebrate that and give thanks for that. Uh, but Lord, we also pray for those who are live streaming with us or perhaps visiting with us uh, who may not be sure of their salvation. We, want, we ask that, the, that Ruach HaKodesh uh, would minister to their hearts and draw them to yourself uh, that they might have an assurance in what Messiah has done for them. And that together as a community, you might rejoice in your presence over your goodness. And now we ask for your blessing uh, upon Israel. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And we pray that the Prince of Peace would be made known, that there'll be internal and external peace, all that comes in what Messiah has done. Uh, may your blessing abide upon the service. Uh, be with our cantor David. Give him the strength to serve and honor your name. Uh, we ask your blessing now, B'Shem Yeshua, HaMashiach, Adonainu, in the name of Yeshua, the Messiah, Amen. I'm going to ask Miriam to come up uh, and light the candles. Rukata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech Olam, Asher Kitshanu B'Mashiach Yeshua, V'Tzivanu Lihiot Or Laolam. Amen. Let's read it together. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us in Messiah Yeshua and instructed us to be a light to the world. And let's uh, do the Shekhianu prayer together. Uh, that is a thankful prayer that he has brought us to this season and kept us along the way. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Shekhianu vekimanu vehigianu lazman hazeh Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has kept us in life and has preserved us and has enabled us to reach this season. Amen. I'd like to invite Chen Chetzroni and James Rogers to come forward. They're going to be holding the Sifrei Torah as I chant the Kol Nidre. Would you please stand? We'll recite it together in English first. May God keep me from making any improper vows, bonds, resolutions, promises, obligations, and oaths to him which we might foolishly vow, swear, and bind ourselves from this day of atonement to the next day of atonement. May God cause all things to work together for our good, even those improper vows to God, as we will repent of having made them. By his mercy in Yeshua, they shall be absolved, released, annulled, made void, and of none effect. They shall not be binding, nor shall they have any power to keep me from my testimony in Messiah's righteousness. In regards to any disregarding of our commitment to Yeshua, our vows shall not be vows, our bonds shall not be bonds, and our oaths shall not be oaths. Now may I take to heart Yeshua's words and let my yes be yes and my no be no.
You may be seated. Please join me reading aloud in yellow text. A Psalm of David, a Maschil. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom Hashem does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. Selah. I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to Hashem, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Selah. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. Selah. Please stand for the Baruch Hu and the Shema. Baruch Hu et Adonai. Hamevorach, Baruch Adonai Hamvorach, Le'olam Va'ed. Bless the Lord, the Blessed One. Blessed is the Lord, the Blessed One, for all eternity. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai e. Baruch Shem Kevod Malchuto Le'olam Ba'ed Ve'ahavta Et Adonai Elohecha V'chol avavcha Uvcha nafshecha Uvcha me'odecha V'hayu Harvarim ha'ele, asher anochi mitzavecha, hayom alvavecha, veshinantam levanecha, bidibarta pam, veshivtecha bevetecha, uflechtecha vaderech. Uv shachbecha, uv kumecha, uk shartam leot al yadecha, vehayu le totafot, bene necha, uk tavtam al mizuzo betecha, uvisharecha. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever and ever. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk on the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them upon the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. Please join us in the Chatzik Kaddish. Yitkadal ve'yitkadash shemei raba ve'olma divrachirutei the Yamlich Malchute Becha Ye Hon Uvio Me Hon Uvra Ye De Hope Israel Bagala Bagala Uvisman Karib Veimru Amen. Yehesh me rabba me barach leolam ulal me almaya yitvah. 
Barach, Yid Barach, Ve Yishtabach, Ve Yid Pa'al, Ve Yid Roman, Ve Yid Nasei, Ve Yid Tadar, Ve Yid Aleh, Ve Yid Alal, Shmed Kudja, Brichu, Le'ela, Min kobirchata v'shirata, tush bechata v'nechemata, damiran be'olma, ve'imru, amen. O se shalom b'mromat, hu ya'ase shalom aleinu, Ve'al ko Yisrael, ve'imru, imru, amen. May his great name grow exalted and sanctified in the world that he created as he will, in your lifetimes and in your days, and in the lifetimes of all the house of Israel, swiftly and soon. And we say, Amen. May his great name be blessed forever and ever. Blessed, praised, glorified, exalted, extolled, mighty, upraised, and lauded be the name of the Holy One, blessed is he. Beyond any blessing and song, praise and consolation that are uttered in the world. And we say, Amen. He who makes peace in his heights, May he make peace upon us and upon all Israel. And we say, Amen. You may be seated. Please join me in the response of reading by reading aloud on the yellow text. This is to be a fasting ordinance for you. On the tenth day of the seventh month, you must deny yourselves and not do any work. Whether native born or a foreigner residing among you, because on this day, atonement will be made for you, to cleanse you. Then before Hashem, you will be clean from all your sins. Join me. It is, it is a, a Shabbat Shabbaton, Shabbaton, and you, you must, must deny yourselves. It is a lasting ordinance. The Kohen who is anointed and ordained to succeed his father as Kohen Gadol is to make atonement. He is to put on the sacred linen garments and make atonement for the most holy place, for the tent of meeting and the altar, and for the Kohanim and the members of the community. This is to be a lasting ordinance for you. Atonement is to be made once a year for all the sins of the Israelites. And it was done as the Lord commanded Moshe. For the, for the life, life of the flesh is in the, in the blood. blood. And I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. And every Kohen stands daily at his service offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Messiah had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Please stand and join us in the Asham Nu. Asham Nu. Asham Nu. Bagad Nu. Bagad nu, Gazal nu, Gazal nu, Dibaru dofi, Dib 
translation or what we just sang. We are guilty. We have betrayed. We have robbed. We have spoken slander. We have caused perversion. We have caused wickedness. We have sinned willfully. We have been violent. We have falsely accused. We have counseled evil. We have been unfaithful. We have scorned. We have rebelled, we have provoked, we have turned the way, we have been perverse, we acted wantonly, we have persecuted, we have been obstinate, we have been wicked, we have corrupted, we have been abominable, we have strayed, and we have led others astray. Please join us in the Alchet, first in the English and then in the Hebrew. For the sin which we have committed before you under compulsion or of our own will, and for the sin which we have committed before you by hardening our hearts, for the sin which we have committed before you with our eyes, and for the sin which we have committed before you with our thoughts, for the sin which we have committed before you with our speech, and for the sin which we have committed before you by profaning your name, for the sin which we have committed before you by slander, and for the sin by which we have committed before you by baseless hatred. For all these sins, O God of mercy, forgive us, pardon us, grant us atonement in Messiah's name. They are Kulam Eloha Selichot Selach Lanu Michal Lanu Kapelanu Veal Kulam Eloha 
Selichot, Selach Lanu, Michal Lanu, Kaperlanu. You may be seated. Please continue to join me responsibly on the yellow text. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom. Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be turned to you. Deliver me from the guilt of shedding blood, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, that my mouth may declare your praise. For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. By your favor do good to Zion, build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices, in burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then young bulls will be offered on your altar. Please stand and join us as we sing Avinu Malkenu to our King. Avinu Malkenu, Chanenu Vanenu, Avinu Malkenu, Chanenu Vanenu. Kien banu masim, ase imanu, zakava chesed, ase imanu, zakava chesed, vehoshi.
Our Father, our King, be merciful and answer us. Though we plead no merit, deal with us according to your loving kindness and answer us. You may be seated. I'm certainly thankful for the extra service that the servants of this congregation provide during the holidays and holy days, service unto our God and Savior. I'm very thankful for all that they do out of a heart of devotion. Uh, it's certainly a blessing. Yes, the nursery is open. <laughs> inquiring minds want to know. Uh, and so we want to appreciate what we'll be uh, considering, you know, with all that Yom Kippur has come to mean to the Jewish people, uh, it's taken on, in a sense, a life of its own uh, with many traditions that are uh, additional to the scriptures uh, and some traditions that sometimes uh, may distract some of us from, from what the scripture actually teaches. We'll be taking a look at the heart of it this evening as we study. Uh, but for those, how many people are here and it's your first Day of Atonement service? Raise your hand. Well, God bless you. I'm so thankful to have you here. Otherwise, I'd be all by myself. Thank you. Uh, if you came looking for an oneg, a wonderful time of refreshments, I have to be the bearer of bad tidings. Uh, that'll happen not until this coming Shabbat. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, one of the traditions is that we fast. Uh, as we uh, humble our souls, one expression of that has been fasting. Uh, and so we appreciate that. That's something that uh, became so a uh, part of the lifestyle that the prophet Isaiah actually identified the Day of Atonement with fasting. And it became known as Hatzon, the fast, uh, as we'll see. Uh, other traditions, some of you may be wondering, uh, in, boy, there's a lot of white laundry going on around here. I mean, what's happening with that? Well, there's a lot of different traditions, including why we wear white on Yom Kippur tonight and tomorrow. Uh, and so we, we do that. There's a number of reasons. I'll give you my favorite of all of them. It's because of the Day of Atonement and what it represents. Uh, fill in the blanks for me. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white. Oh, there you go. Uh, and so we therefore represent as much. This is the only one of two evening services where we wear a, a talit, uh, a prayer shawl, uh, as it's known. Uh, we only wear it usually on, on Shabbat morning, of course. Uh, but there's, there's some special traditions. Uh, but what we'll be taking a look this evening is at what the scriptures actually teach, at the very heart of what the Day of Atonement is all about. We have some scripture to read. Uh, please stand, if you will. Let's read it together in unison out loud. Uh, here we go. Hashem spoke to Moses, saying, on exactly the tenth of the seventh month, is the Day of Atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you, and you shall humble your souls and present an offering by fire to Hashem. You shall not do any work on the same day, for it's a Day of Atonement to make atonement on your behalf before Hashem your God. If there is any person who will not humble himself on this same day, he shall be cut off from his people. As for any person who does any work on the same day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall do no work at all. It is to be a perpetual statute throughout your generations in all your dwelling places. It is to be a Sabbath of complete rest to you. And you shall humble your souls on the ninth of the month evening. From evening unto evening, you shall keep your Sabbath. Just want you to note, if you will, uh, that the atonement is both 
uh, in verse 27 to Hashem, and then in verse 28 before Hashem. Hashem uh, means the name that deals with the covenantal name, the tetragrammaton as such uh, uh, of the Lord. Uh, and then it has to do with humbling and then resting. And so there's various elements that are essential. Uh, let's pray and ask the Lord to help us to make it essential for our lives. Uh, Father, we do bring this before you and we thank you uh, for the good news of our Messiah, uh, that uh, in his finished work we have atonement. Uh, we have a perfect atonement. Uh, and therefore we thank you uh, for the cleansing of our sins. Uh, not just for forgiveness, but for the fullness of life. And we thank you as well, Lord, uh, for your blessing on our families. Uh, we ask that our homes may be pleasing to you, as the atonement is centered to our lives and our relationships, and that the atonement would be on our mind and on our hearts as we run this race that's been set before us, looking unto Yeshua, the author and the finisher of our faith. And so we ask even now that we'll grow in the fullness of our atonement, that we'll understand this reconciliation we have with our God and appreciate that finished work all the more. We ask for your blessing not only upon us, but for all Israel, and we also pray for the nations, that all will come to know this atonement. In Messiah's name we ask it, Amen. Please be seated, if you will. Uh, and so, uh, for many people, especially if this is your first day of atonement uh, service, uh, I'm going to try to give you some background to help you understand the scriptures along with the rest of us. Uh, as we consider this, it may seem strange to those who are uh, live streaming from different parts of the world, uh, and you may be going to churches uh, where not only is the Day of Atonement as such uh, not observed or celebrated in any way, uh, it may actually be considered a quite a, sus uh, a, quite a, a, a susp suspicious thing. You might be suspect of it. Uh, why do we need to do that? I mean, the atonement's been made. Well, for those of us who've come to know Messiah and we follow the New Covenant Scriptures, we want to understand that the New Covenant scriptures assume that we'll be uh, observing the Day of Atonement. And for two reasons, if I might say to you, uh, read with me the scripture at the top of the screen, please, from Hebrews uh, chapter 9, verse 7 and 12. Let's read that. The high priest enters once a year, not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people. Messiah, through his own blood, entered the holy place once and for all, having understand the, the theology that the writers of the New Covenant understood about the Day of Atonement. They understood that the once a year Day of Atonement was the foundation, the background, and the pattern for the once and for all sacrifice. So let's appreciate how the new covenant looked. It just assumed by them uh, that it was uh, just part and parcel of understanding uh, what Messiah had done for us. And therefore, you say, well, that doesn't mean it meant anything. No, they observed it. How do we know that? Well, we know that because of the scripture at the bottom of the screen. Luke, when he was recording uh, the book of Acts, uh, the records of what the Holy Spirit did uh, through the Shelachim, the apostles, he uh, in included in regarding the shipwreck of Paul in Acts 27, he had this unusual date marker. Uh, uh, in, in Acts 27, 9, at the bottom of the screen, read that verse with me, if you will, please. Here we go. And when much time had been spent, and sailing was now dangerous, because the fast, the fast, well, that, uh, you may wonder, uh, and may have read the, your, the, the New Testament or New Covenant writings for yourself many times and come over that, and they just passed over, not thinking uh, that it was of any particular interest. 
Well, it was a date marker. Luke was trying to let every reader know when uh, the shipwreck of Paul took place. And he says it because the fast was already over. The fast was, as I mentioned earlier, another name for the Day of Atonement. And he thought every reader of the New Covenant would understand uh, the fast and the Day of Atonement because they observed it. It'd be like me writing something and saying that on Labor Day this occurred. And every American would say, well, of course I know when that takes place. Uh, that, take, that takes place early September. I know that. And so it would not be a shock to anyone uh, that we would do have a, a, a service uh, on the Day of Atonement. Why? Because it was normative for all New Covenant believers uh, to uh, observe and celebrate uh, Yom Kippur. It was just as ordinary as getting a day off on Labor Day. And very few of you are saying, no, Yeshua fulfilled all my labors for me. I refuse to take that day off. No, I'm sure you're quite observant. <laughs> uh, and so understand what was normative for the theological reasons, uh, also for the normal, normalcy of, of its observance. We want to appreciate for ourselves exactly what it means for us. What it meant for the New Covenant believers of the first century means exactly the same thing for all believers today. And if you haven't yet come to faith in the Messiah, this might be of interest to you, that the very faith we have is the fulfillment of what the Day of Atonement was all about. It's not a different faith. It's the faith that sees the fulfillment of the Day of Atonement in light of the work of the Messiah. And so we want to appreciate that. So if you're new here and you haven't yet come to personally trust in Yeshua the Messiah or his atoning, atoning death, his sacrifice for you, this might be a great encouragement for you as you understand that he is the fulfillment of everything the people of Israel have ever hoped for. And so as we consider the matter, uh, all the appointed times uh, from Passover through Sukkot, tabernacles as such, including the Day of Atonement, are the biblical template of scriptural faith. Uh, they actually outline our faith. Uh, as all we as we grow into the, these festivals, and all of them are God's schedule for world redemption. Uh, we'll consider that next week, next Shabbat morning, as we look at Sukkot and uh, the prophetic element of of the Feast of Tabernacles, and also uh, all of the festivals uh, that were the believing congregation's annual calendar. Uh, you say, what do you mean? Every congregation that believed in Yeshua the Messiah had the festivals as their calendar. You say, well, hold it a second. I go to a church, and our calendar uh, basically has to do with Christmas and Easter. Yes, I understand. That's the tradition that they follow in the churches. Uh, but there's no biblical teaching for that. Uh, but all the biblical teaching and how the New Covenant itself uh, expresses faith in Messiah is through the calendar of the Bible, which has to do with the festivals of the Lord. And so all of these testify uh, to Yeshua's saving work, uh, to the Jew especially, and equally to the Gentile. And so that's how that rolls. Uh, in regards to most of the festivals, uh, if, if you've been around here for a while, most of our holidays and we often say, they tried to kill us, God saved us, let's eat. Well, we don't eat. Uh, this is a day that's unusual for us. Uh, and, and you say, well, uh, should we observe it that way? Yeah, yes, we do. Let me tell you why. We identify with God's burden for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. We identify with God's great burden. Uh, he still weeps over Jerusalem, and so should we. 
That's why the good news is still to the Jew first and equally to the Gentiles. If it's not equally to the Gentiles, it's not to the Jew first. And if it's not to the Jew first, you Gentiles have a real problem. And so we want to understand the way the Bible reads for us as we consider this. And so regarding the Day of Atonement, as we'll consider it uh, in Leviticus, the Hebrew text uses plural pronouns. Uh, you say, well, why is that? Because it wasn't necessarily initially intended for an individual salvation. It was for the nation of Israel, uh, for their salvation. Uh, for the nation to be restored as a servant nation to God. You say, but it says that if they don't humble themselves, they'll be destroyed. Yes, they'll be cut off from the people. They're not identifying with the nation. The nation was being restored annually in its servant, servant compa capacity uh, to serving the Lord God. Uh, and if they did not identify, they therefore were not identifying with the people, were cut off from the people. And so we want to understand uh, that this is the annual renewal for Israel, uh, and in the end, for Israel's national revival and redemption. Uh, we'll look at that, as I mentioned, uh, tomorrow morning with more detail. And so on this holy day, as we see in the portion here, it contains God's Yom Kippur principles. And so by application, we understand how this is foundational for all that Messiah has done for our atonement, for our reconciliation with God. Uh, and so uh, it'll apply past, present, and future, for he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so it's all about him, and therefore it's all for our good. And so the outline you have in your bulletin there, our faith in his perfect sacrifice, receives our whole redemption. First thing we'll look at, receiving the whole redemption that he provided for us. Revealed in our humble repentance. That's how uh, we show our faith, through our humble repentance. And results in our heavenly rest. We'll take a look at this. We go through the section. You'll notice it's outlined accordingly. And so the first matter here regarding our whole redemption, his perfect sacrifice, uh, uh, re receives our whole redemption, what he has done for us. And so let's appreciate that uh, it says here, remember I, I pointed out to you the scriptures speak about this atonement in two ways, uh, an offering by fire to Hashem, to the Lord, and then uh, an atonement on your behalf uh, before the Lord. Well, first let's take a look at this, because to Hashem, offering by fire, uh, that has to do uh, with a bloody sacrifice upon the altar. I've spent some time, as many of you have, uh, for this, for Yom Kippur. I've been studying through uh, the text uh, in Vayikra, in Leviticus chapter 16 especially, uh, and recognizing uh, many, many offerings, there's a lot of bloody sacrifices that were made. Uh, and so we want to understand uh, what it's saying right at the outset here. There could be no atonement without a blood, bloody sacrifice. Uh, there, why a bloody sacrifice? Why would it be required? I mean, the world we live in today, and quite frankly, it seems a little barbaric uh, in the world we live in today. Uh, most of us know only about hunting and fishing as it applies to Harris Teeter. Uh, we would probably be, you know, uh, not able to actually kill our own meat and hunt our own fish uh, without puking or something like that. Uh, we live in a rather soft society that way. Uh, not so much when you read through the Bible. Uh, we want to understand that blood sacrifice was required by God uh, because of the devastation that sin has caused God and ourselves. And we'll take a look at those two points. Uh, the devastation that sin has caused God and to ourselves. And so we read uh, uh, as a community, we read this, uh, the readings together 
uh, from Leviticus 17. Let's read it again, like we can't read it enough on the right side of the screen. Let's read that in unison. Here we go. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. I've given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your lives. For it is the blood that makes atonement on behalf of the life. There is no atonement apart from the blood sacrifice. There's just no such thing in the Bible. There's nothing in the Bible about that. And we'll get into that somewhat fully. And so it says, present an offering by fire to Hashem. This has to do with the penalty of sin. Uh, to Hashem, you say, I don't understand. What do you mean? It's for his sake. It's for the sake of the Lord. Why do you mean the sake of the Lord? I'm the one with the sins. I need the help. You don't understand what sin has done. Sin has not only destroyed your soul, but it also has desecrated the name of our God. Being created in his image, we therefore are created in his image to relate to God and thereby relating to God, we can represent God. But sin breaks the relationship, and so we misrepresent God. And so God's name has been desecrated. And so the first aspect of the matter of atonement has to do not so much with us, but with God, and therefore the honor that his name is due, uh, and our desecration is therefore dealt with through the atonement. His name is only sanctified through blood sacrifice. And so we want to understand this penalty that comes about. The soul that sins, it will die uh, uh, because we have desecrated his name. And so the atonement, what the atonement does, it makes Kedush Hashem sanctification of the name. Remember how Yeshua taught us uh, our Father who is in heaven. What's the next phrase? Sanctified be your name. This is exactly what we're talking about and what happens because of the atonement. And then secondly, as I noted for you, it also says to make atonement on your behalf before Hashem, your God. And so let's understand this matter. Not only does it desecrate his name, but it cuts us off from God. When it says before Hashem, it is before his face, before his presence. We are cut off from the presence of God. And so on our behalf now, on our behalf to come back into the presence of God, to be able to worship him, you say me say, hold it, Sam. <laughs> I pray quite often. I always pray in the King James English. I say, thou art the Lord. And I always say it in a way that sounds rather sanctimonious. Well, good for you. It doesn't help you whatsoever. You say, well, what do you mean? Do I have to pray in the NIV? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that you have to understand that your prayers are a vanity. They're in vain because of sin. Because of sin. There is no worship nor atonement without the blood sacrifice because of our sin nature. Uh, we can't help ourselves in that regard. And so we appreciate that fact. We understand the atonement by blood uh, because of the separation. Because of the set, you say, I don't believe that's true. I can understand that. Because you may be going about you know, these matters according to your own thinking, or your own experience, or your own feelings. I had a man who recently, uh, I was sharing Messiah with him, uh, a fellow Yid, and uh, he was saying, well, I think I do quite rightly, and I'm, I'm sure God is just fine with me. And I, I only could say to him, in your mind, in the God of your mind, maybe, not in the God of reality, you say, what do you mean? Read with me the scripture on the right side of the screen, please, from Isaiah the prophet, uh, 59, verse 1 and 2. Let's read it together. Here we go. Behold, Hashem's hand is not so short that he cannot say, nor his ear so dull that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. 
He does not hear. Do you get that? I didn't make that up. No. I would like chocolate to be calorie free. If I was creating a universe, uh, et cetera, I would like a lot of things, you know, to be very different, like, you know, my Medicare covers my dental program, things like that. <laughs> but I'm not in charge. That's just the way that is. But God is in charge, and so he's letting us know that one of the results is that we're cut off from the presence of God. There is no worship, let alone atonement, without a blood sacrifice. We're separated from God before Hashem, your God. Uh, and so, therefore, we want to understand God wants us in his presence. God desires us to be in his presence. God created us because he loves us and wants us to have fellowship with him. And so his heart is broken that we're not in his presence because of sin. But he is not desirous of the death of anyone, but that they should repent and live. God wants you to live and live in his sight. Live in fellowship with him. And that happens through the atonement. Make atonement on your behalf. And so on your behalf, atonement is a made-up word, at one mint. It has to do with reconciliation, at one. It reconciles. This is the, what makes a difference in a marriage. What makes a difference in a marriage is not whether we get along. It's not matter whether we have a lot in common. It has nothing to do with our favorite colors being the same thing, or our favorite movies, or something like that. It has everything to do with the atonement that Messiah made to bring reconciliation, so we can forgive each other, be merciful to each other, be kind to one another. Everything in our, any relationship has to do with what God has done in the Messiah, in the atonement, to reconcile us to himself and therefore to one another. And so if you were to die without the blood sacrifice, you would not just be separated from God now, but you'd be separated from God forever. That breaks God's heart. He wants you to trust in Messiah. He wants you to trust in the provision he made so you can have fellowship with him. And so we want to understand the second issue not only because of, of the fact that it offends God, but it separates us from God. And so let's understand this as to make atonement on your behalf. And so on the left side of the screen, I have from Leviticus 17.11. And the new covenant picks up on the very same truth. Uh, when I grew up, of course, uh, in, a, in a traditional Jewish home, uh, we certainly uh, were fasting and observing Yom Kippur every year, uh, etc., uh, but uh, I never understood uh, that the New Covenant, the New Testament for our visitors, the New Covenant actually has the same uh, teaching. Because as we read from Leviticus 17.11, that you need the blood atonement to have, uh, the blood sacrifice to have atonement. So the new covenant says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. The very same principle, the same truth uh, that shows the fulfillment in the Messiah. And so the atoned by blood because of the pardon. The promise of Messiah's sacrifice. God promised that the Messiah would be the final sacrifice, the final atonement for our sins. As he says in Isaiah 53, 6, can you see it at the bottom left of the screen? Let's read it together out loud. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But our Shem has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. You say, that, when I first saw that, someone showed me that before I was, came to faith in Yeshua. When they first showed me that, I thought they were tricking me. I was absolutely certain that was from their New Testament. I was absolutely convinced my Bible could not possibly say such a thing. Uh, but I was wrong, uh, and God is right. And so uh, God had promised uh, that Messiah would be the final atonement. He, all our sins would fall upon him. 
And so Yom Kippur foreshadows Messiah's sacrifice. That's why when you read through the text, as we just read in English, you may not see it clearly in the English, uh, but the nouns and pronouns are all plural. Yom Kippur is for national Israel, and this will be fulfilled in Yeshua. When our people tomorrow morning will be taking a deep, a deep dive on that, uh, when uh, nation of Israel, national Israel, the Jewish people in general, uh, when they come to personal faith, national faith, uh, then all Israel will be saved, as was prophesied in the New Covenant, when they trust in Yeshua's atonement. And just as they had to make atonement back then, and so therefore the fulfillment is the Messiah for Israel as well. The word atone, uh, kippura, etc., means to cover, to cover. It's a covering. It's a big cover-up so to speak. Uh, that being said, uh, what, what does that mean? So our sins would not be seen. All of those sacrifices back in the day, they were all good faith promise offerings. By faith they made those sacrifices, but Messiah would pay them off. He, his sacrifice would not be a covering. It's a cleansing. His sacrifice is perfect, and therefore there's a cleansing, a complete cleansing of sin. And so uh, the Day of Atonement in the Hebrew, uh, Yom Kippurim, Yom Kippurim. It's in the plural. It's in the plural. It's the Day of Atonements, uh, literally. You say, well, what does it mean? There were a lot of sacrifices that were made. Uh, but Messiah's sacrifice is once and for all. One sacrifice that covers everything that needs to be cleansed of sin. Everything that needs to be cleansed, that one-stop shopping, Messiah's sacrifice is all. And so to understand this, I'm going to share this illustration uh, both uh, tonight and tomorrow because it's so important uh, for our people to understand this. Uh, in, in Leviticus chapter 16, we see the various sacrifices for the Day of Atonement, and we see it detailed out that they were to have two goats, one would be a sacrifice, the other would be uh, uh, called Azazel, uh, the scapegoat, etc., two goats. Um, but this is what it says in the Talmud regarding those two goats. They fasten a thread of scarlet between the horns of the scapegoat. Uh, scarlet is red. If it turned white, they rejoiced. And if it did not turn white, they were sad. Why? Because if it turned white, it meant that God had accepted the atonement. If it did not turn white, they were sad. Why? Because God did not accept the atonement. Uh, and so they're kind of understating the sadness. Uh, and so we want to understand that that was what was done uh, in the first century. But we read on in the Talmud, uh, and uh, we read this. For 40 years before the destruction of the temple, the thread of scarlet never turned white, but it remained red. 40 years before the destruction of the temple, you historians all know that took place in 70 AD when the Romans destroyed our temple in Jerusalem. 70 A.D., well, let's do the math. And so 70 A.D., C.E., etc., common error, uh, the sacrifice not accepted, 40 years, subtract from that, 40 from 70, take out your, uh, hold it, you got some uh, fingers and toes time, that's 30, 30 A.D. or 30 C.E. Well, what's the big deal? That's when Yeshua died for our sins. Yeshua died for our sins as the final atonement, and therefore God was giving a statement to the nation of Israel that the atonement has been weighed once and for all, therefore the red cord, red thread will not turn white. Why? Because the final atonement's made, your sins have been cleansed, though they be as scarlet, they are now white as snow. We must understand the perfect sacrifice has been made once and for all in the Messiah. And so while we were still helpless, at the right time Messiah died for the ungodly. All the ungodly, raise your hand. Well, you all, you all basically were confessing sins 
that in some cases you didn't even know how to pronounce. Uh, you notice all the sins were we, 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 right? That's because it's a national issue. We identify accordingly. And so God shows his own love for us that while we're yet sinners, Messiah died for us. We see the fulfillment, the final atonement has been made. God made him who knew no sin to be our sin offering, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. May his name be blessed and praised forever. God has provided for us everything we need. What a great God we have. Glory to his name. You can give him a praise. It's okay. Just understand that I'm not going to stop. Because we want to understand this. Some say, well, what do the Orthodox do? I, I answer this question many times during the year. Uh, if you were to go to uh, Mayor Shireen in Jerusalem or Borough Park, Brooklyn, and many other uh, Lubavitch areas, communities, uh, yesterday you would have seen uh, trucks of chickens in cages all down the street. Uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. Uh, and so you say, well, what is that for? Because even though technically they, they do not uh, uh, believe that they need a blood sacrifice, nonetheless, here's actual pictures. Uh, actually, they take, it's called Shlugi Kapura. Uh, they take the chicken, wave it around the head, and may my sins be upon this chicken. Now, I read the Bible carefully. There's no chickens. Uh, good eating, but not for Kippur, not for atonement at all. But they're recognizing their need. They have a guilt. What do they do about their guilty? This is the problem. The guilt is still there. And therefore, they have to harm this poor chicken because they understand their own guilt. But God has done something better. What should we do? Trust in Yeshua the Messiah. Trust in Yeshua the Messiah. God has provided the perfect sacrifice uh, for our sins. God provided Messiah to die in our place. And that leads us to humbling our souls. The word humble and not in the Hebrew, uh, I understand the Hebrew fairly well. I've studied it quite a bit on this matter, certainly. Uh, and so I understand that... The tra Translate humble people argue about that. Is it to afflict our souls, humble our souls? Well, the rabbis answered the question uh, absolutely by translating the Hebrew Bible into Greek. It's called the Septuagint. Seventy rabbis traditionally wrote uh, the translation in Greek. And in the Greek, the word that's there, uh, tape no o, uh, means to lower or make low, uh, etc. Uh, humble yourself. It's always to lower. Uh, humble yourself in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. Humble, to lower yourself, etc. And so there's humility. What's this humility look like? What's it mean? Uh, it's best seen in the Messiah. Uh, can you see the scripture on the right side of the screen? Uh, read that with me, if you will. Philippians 2 eight. here we go. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by having become obedient to the point of death, even to death on the cross. His, this humility is perfectly seen in Yeshua because he obediently identified with his death on our behalf. He identified. What did humbling mean? It didn't mean to feel bad about yourself. Oh, I'm such a miserable Messiah. I don't know. I probably could have turned the water into wine more often. I don't know. No. No. It had to, his humbling was in his death. Understand what the Bible is teaching us about humbling ourselves on this matter. To humble yourself means you recognize there's no merit in me for my atonement. No good thing in my flesh, as the scripture says. Nothing I can do to pay for my sins. There's nothing I can do. I cannot fast enough. I can't do enough. Nothing I can do will cover my sins. And so I have to what? Trust in the sacrifice. See, that's what humbling meant. They did not look to themselves. They looked 
to the atonement. They look to the, that's what humbling means. Just like with Yeshua, him humbling himself in obedience to the point of death. Humbling is looking to the death, the death of Messiah in this regard. This expresses faith in the atonement. Looking to him and not yourself. So our humble repentance, our humiliating repentance, looks to the sacrifice, relying upon him, confessing him, trusting in him. And it's certainly not just fasting uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, if that's helpful to you, many of us will be fasting, uh, not for forgiveness of our sins. Forgiveness of my sins doesn't come through fasting. It doesn't come through humbling my soul. It comes by the death of Messiah. I'm trusting in that. That's what humility and humbling of the soul means. And so the sovereign God who graciously gave us atonement by blood declared it's graciously available to all who will believe on Messiah by humbly looking to the sacrifice for sins in all areas of life, in your time, your talent, your treasure, in your relationships, in your thought life, looking to his atonement. This is what the new covenant taught. Solemnly testifying, it says at the bottom of the screen, solemnly testifying both Jews and Greeks of repentance towards God and faith in our Lord. You notice something? Repentance towards God means faith in the Lord. Repentance, humbling your soul, has to do with faith in the Lord. And so, therefore, when you repent, you're trusting in the sacrifice, not yourself. When you're humbling yourself, you're looking to the sacrifice, not yourself. That is what it means to be humble before the Lord, uh, etc. And so the last thing before we close in prayer, our faith in his perfect sacrifice results as a result in heavenly rest. It's to be a Sabbath of complete rest, it says there. This is the result. This is the result. And so this is why Yeshua promised you his rest. In his death is his rest for you. Your rest is given as a gift from him. This is what God said in Psalm 95, which my wife has adequately taught on many occasions, and also taught in Hebrews chapter 3 and chapter 4, where they could not enter God's rest. How do you enter that rest? Through his death, you enter that rest. And it's the rest that God has that he gives to you. God's own rest. When he rested from his labors after creation, it's his rest. When you're trusting in his works, not your own. And so this is the result. This is why Yeshua said, Come unto me, whole labor and heavy laden, and I will give you He can give it to you. You see, it's his to give when you trust in his death. You say, well, I, I was wondering why I don't have peace in my heart. Because you're not trusting in his death, in his sacrifice. You're looking to circumstances or situations or whatever. No, you need to trust in what he has done for you. The result of that is the rest, because he's the prince of peace. He is our true, he's the Lord of the Sabbath, our true Shabbat. And so I have to ask, is there complete rest? Is there complete rest? Incomplete rest is due to a lack of trust in Yeshua's eternally perfect atonement. And so, therefore, if you're not applying his death to your time, your talent, your treasure, your thoughts, your relationships, there won't be rest in those areas. This is how you can know if you've humbled your soul in those areas. What? Yes, regarding my time and your time. I humbly yield to the Lord, and therefore I can redeem the time. I die to myself in it, to my own want to, how I want to use it, my own preferences, my own inclinations. I look to his death, die to myself, therefore I have rest in my time. I don't have to be so impatient. I don't have to be so frantic. I don't have to be so worried about all these things. I just say this could help you uh, limiting the number of tickets you get for driving. This could be a helpful thing for you. Very practical. 
but also in your time, your talent, your treasure, in every area of life where you have not humbly trusted in his death, in those areas, there's no rest. This is how you know what to bring to the Lord, what areas of your life you can entrust to him. Applying his death in our humility in each area, our death to self, our own preferences, our own cl- we die to that. We have no merit, nothing to, I have nothing to bring to the table. My time can be redeemed only in him. My talents and abilities only in him. My treasure only in him. Our death to self in this, we follow his word because it's all about Yeshua. And so on behalf of our congregation, we close with prayer. And I want to just uh, wish you all uh, a blessing uh, of the Lord. Gemar uh, Katima Tova. May your life be sealed in the book of life. B'Shem Yeshua. In Messiah, you have the atonement, forgiveness, and new life. In Messiah and in him alone. Let's pray together. Avinu, we are thankful to call you Father because you love us as your children. And we pray that even now you'll minister to our own souls. Those areas of our life, Lord, time, talent, treasure, wherever there is a lack of rest, a lack of peace, where we desire things you haven't given us, or we don't want the things you want us to have, whatever they may be, oh God. We bring them to you now. And so, my dear family, even though we close our eyes to concentrate in prayer, not to be distracted, I ask you even now in your own heart, talk to the Lord. Cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. Bring to him those areas that make you frantic, worried, anxious, all those areas of your life. He can do something about it in the atonement of Messiah. In the atonement of the Messiah, you'll be set free in those areas, forgiven in those areas, empowered to live out the life of God in those areas to the glory of God. God hears your heart. In your heart, pray with me this simple prayer. Dear God, uh, forgive me for my worry. Forgive me for my anxiety. Forgive me for my uh, restless thoughts. Forgive me for being distracted from looking to Yeshua. Forgive me for trusting in myself, looking to my own works, even my fasting and other things like that. Oh, forgive me, Lord, for I recognize you. I place my faith in Yeshua. Thank you for cleansing me. Thank you for saving me. And while everyone's eyes are bowed in prayer, everyone else's eyes, everyone else's eyes are closed in prayer, I want to pray for you. You may be here, uh, and therefore placing your faith in him may be for salvation as you trust in his atonement for your life. So right where you are, if you prayed that prayer, and for you it was placing your faith for salvation, by placing your faith for the first time in what he has done for you, right? We are just raise your hand once. Just raise your hand while you're sitting. Right? We are so I can just pray for you in closing. Go ahead. It's okay, sure. I see your hand. Absolutely. Anyone else, just raise your hand once. Go ahead. Happy to pray for you. Right we are. Right we are. Right we are. Amen. Father, you see our hands. You see our you know us. <laughs> you know us and yet you love us. Oh, thank you, Lord. Even now, confirm to our hearts not only the truth of your love, but the perfect salvation in Messiah's atonement. Not only so we'll be blessed, but that we might be your instrument of blessing to others. It's in Messiah's name we give thanks. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 Hope you have an easy fast. Should you survive the evening, we have a morning service that begins at 10.30 tomorrow, and we hope you'll come.
and join us. Would you stand and join me, the Vene Emar, and then I'll close with the Birkat Koanim. Vene Emar, Behaya Adonai, Lemele Chal Koharetz, Bayom Hahu, Bayom Hahu, Yie Adonai Echad. Ushemo, Ushemo, Ushemo Echad. And it is said, the Lord shall be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one, and his name one. Would you please close your eyes and bow your heads, as I bless you with Berkat Kohanim. Yivrechecha Adonai veyishmerecha Ya'er Adonai panavelecha v'chuneka Yisa Adonai panavelecha v'yasem lecha Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. So, Nkol, have an easy fast. Thank you for coming. <laughs>